Hey everyone, welcome back to Power Electronics. I'm Tim, and today we're kind of looking at a slightly different thing in Power Electronics, and that is DC modeling of converters. So, what does that even mean? Well, what we've been looking at, I mean, I could draw whatever converter I want here, but let's, let's draw a boost, just as an example. Right, so we've been looking at these converters and we've been assuming that they you know, switch back and forth between two states, right? So maybe one state looks like this for the boost. And the other state looks something like this, right? Right, so there's inherently kind of like this really fast alternation between these two states. And there's actually a lot of information contained in that. It, it, um, a lot of stuff goes on in that transition. If you, if you think back to you know switching loss, right? If we think about switching loss and you know, the transition between one state and another, it's not so simple as, you know, it just uh, it doesn't look like a, a straight line. You know, some stuff happens, right? It takes some time to rise up. It takes some time to fall back down. And maybe the most complex stuff happens in these transition points like this is like the these transition points are like the craziest part of a converter right all, all these currents are flowing in different directions voltages are changing currents are going around sometimes we refer to these things as you know high dvdt situations or high didt situations right and really just this just refers to the fact that the change in the voltages and the currents is really fast in these moments. And I mean, it's not insurmountable, but it does add a lot of complexity. Maybe to simplify how we understand switch mode power supplies, we can eliminate the switching behavior. All right, and eliminate, I don't mean like it just disappears from the operation. I just mean maybe we won't look at the switching behavior specifically and instead think about the DC characteristics. We fo like maybe maybe what we should do is focus on the DC characteristics. And then eventually we can also extend this to dynamic characteristics. Right, how it, how the converter states, right, the, the currents and voltages, how those vary over time when the converter is subjected to changes in the load current or the input voltage or whatever. All right, eventually we can take this idea in that direction. And this has benefits for simulation as well, because when you simulate a converter and you include all this high frequency information here, right, all, all these transitions, simulating these takes time. Transitions takes time. Alright, so if we can eliminate these transitions, then we can simulate faster and kind of make it easier to understand what's going on in the converter without thinking about the high frequency switching characteristics. Cool. So, how do we do that? Well, we do it basically through reinterpreting IVSB and CCB as circuits. So we'll, we'll get to what that means, but we're really reinterpreting these equations because IVSB and CCB really do take and eliminate the switching characteristics of, of a system, right? You average over a switching cycle, which means you kind of ignore the high frequency behavior and instead look at the cycle by cycle behavior, which is inherently lower frequency, you could say. So how do we do this? Well, let's let's use an example to highlight this. 
And I'm just going to, you know, make up a converter. So sometimes what I'm about to draw this input stage, sometimes referred to as a full bridge or an H bridge or something, you know, what, whatever you want, however you want to say it. All right, so it's this bridge of four switches, and this is used in AC to DC converters, and vice versa. It can be used as a rectifier or a uh, or an inverter. And what I'm going to do is connect that to an inductor and a load capacitor and a resistor. So how do we come up with it with this DC model? Well, we still have to break it down and look at the two ind individual uh, switching states. So I'll do that. And maybe to do that, we should actually really define these, these four switches. So I'll call this uh, M1, M2, M3, M4. And the two states are in one state M1 and M2 are on and the other state M or M1 and M4 are on in one state, and M2 and M3 are on in the other state. So let's just quickly go through that. So again, here we have M1, M4, and here we have M2, M3. Great. All right, let's draw it out. So M1 is on, meaning our circuit looks something like this. M4 is on, so this goes to ground. And actually, as I'm doing this, I realize that I should probably define the direction of the voltage and current, right? So this is V out, this is VC, you could say. All right, so this is VL, IC. So yeah, IC is flowing in this direction. Perfect, and that, that should be what we need, right? So we have a resistor. Great, so yeah, th this is you know the first half and the second half. Again, the input voltage is VG. The second half, we have M2 and M3, so this is on. goes to ground. Right, so basically what we're doing is we're flipping the output, the inductor and capacitor and resistor, back and forth. Right, we're, in, we're kind of inverting it with respect to the input. And this is VG, right, VG, V out, V out, VG over here, right, and it's not so complicated, but again, we should still write out IVSB, so let's do that. Right, so IVSB says that the average uh, inductor voltage, sorry, over one switching cycle is equal to zero. And if we just do the, the quick way, basically we have D times, well, on one side is VG, on the other side is V out, so VG minus V out. And at D prime, we have, well, on one side, well, on both sides, really, it's minus VG minus V out. So, and that is equal to zero. And if we simplify this, well, we notice that the V outs are, you know, the same, the same sign and the VGs are different signs. So we're going to have a V out on one side, V out, and that is equal to D plus D minus D prime VG. So D minus D prime times VG. And if we simplify this, we get 2d minus 1. So this is 2d minus 1 is equal to v out over vg. So this is like the conversion ratio, right? This can go plus and minus. So let's just, this is m of d as a function of d, goes between minus 1 and 1, and it looks something like this. So when D is 0.5, the output voltage is actually zero, and you just have stuff rippling around. 
Cool, so that's IVSB. We have to do another equation, right, for CCB. CCB is pretty straightforward, right? Because the inductor is connected to the capac capacitor in both switching cycles. So we have D. Well, let's just remind you. Uh, CCB says that the average capacitor current over one switching cycle is equal to zero. And if we do it the quick way, we have D times IL minus V out over our load. And again, this should be little IL plus D prime IL minus V out over our load. That's equal to zero. And because the current is the same in both in both states, then we have that the average inductor current is equal to V out over our load, right? And we also have a third equation. The third equation is related to the input, and this is why I talked about doing the input uh, before. And again, we're just averaging the input current over a switching cycle. Cool, so we're averaging the input current over one switching cycle, and that's equal to the average input current. And in this case, it's equal to, well, one, in one case, it's equal to IL, right? And the other case, if you follow the direction of the current, it's actually equal to minus IL. So we have D IL plus D prime minus IL. And if you notice, again, uh, it looks kind of similar to this in that what we get is that IG should be equal to 2D minus one times IL, right? Which is equal to 2D minus one V out over our load. But we can, we can look Think about it in terms of this. Great. So we have three equations. Let's just uh, let's just rewrite these equations over here. So we have 2d minus 1 times Vg is equal to is equal to V out. Alright, this is like equation one. Second equation is CCB. So this is IVSB. Second equation from CCB. And our third equation says that IG is equal to 2D minus 1 IL. Now, I want to just think about these in a different way. So, think about what we're doing with IVSB. We're summing voltages and equating them to zero. That sounds a lot like a KVL equation, right? The sum of some voltages is equal to zero, right? Voltages around a loop. Think about CCB. We're summing some currents and saying they're equal to zero, right? So the currents going into a node, the sum of currents going into a node should be equal to the sum of the currents going out of a node. So this is kind of like KCL. So the idea really with this DC modeling is to reinterpret these averaged equations as KVL and KCL equations, right? So the ones involving currents are KCL equations, the, one in, the ones involving voltages are KVL. So this thing is like KVL and this thing is like KCL. And additionally, this is also like KCL. Except that their, their, their forms are pretty simple, right? In this, on, in this ideal way. They can get more complicated when, once you start adding stuff, and we'll do that later. But for now, let's let's actually try to draw out what's going on. So, what does this uh, equation say? Well, it says that one voltage is equal to another voltage, or you could rewrite it as 2d minus 1 vg minus b out is equal to zero. Right? So if you think about this in KVL, we have some voltage source. And actually, funnily enough, this voltage source depends on something, right? This voltage source is actually dependent on D. Right, as D varies, this voltage source is also gonna vary. So I'm gonna draw it as a dependent voltage source, that is with a square, right? So this is a voltage 2D minus one VG. And that is equal to another voltage. So if we think about a loop that we draw, then 
the complete circuit should have another voltage over here that is equal and opposite to this voltage, right? It turns out that that voltage is V out. And in this case, I'm going to draw it also as a dependent source, V out, even though it doesn't have a variable of dependence. The reason I'm doing that is because this loop represents an inductor loop, you could say. We derived this equation from the inductor, and you can imagine, you know, like a dotted inductance in this loop, right? We've just eliminated the effects of this inductor, right? We've, we're considering it DC. DC inductor is a short circuit. So this loop equation is relating two voltages, right? The inductor isn't directly, the inductor voltage isn't directly equal to the output voltage, right? It just relates the two voltages. So that's why I'm drawing it as a dependent voltage source. So we have this one loop which has these two dependent voltage sources. Now let's look at equation two. Maybe I'll use a, a different color, I'll use yellow. So equation two, this is like KCL, right? So again, we have IL. This loop really comes from the output capacitance C. So I'm going to draw in a dotted capacitor, right? Just to remind you of the fact that this loop or this node equation is related to a capacitor. So what's going into this capacitor? Well, one thing that's going in, we can interpret the things on the left as currents that are going in. One thing that's going in is IL. So again, I'm going to draw this as a dependent current source that flows into this capacitor, right? And it's equal to IL. And note that the voltage across this cap, Vc, is really equal to V out, right? So the voltage in this, at this node, between this node and ground, is actually equal to V out. The current through this loop is actually equal to IL, right? So we have this current flowing in this loop, which is IL. We have a current over here, which is dependent on this loop, which is equal to IL. So flowing into the cap is IL. Flowing out of this cap, well, it's V out over our load. Remember, the voltage at between these two terminals, between these two points, is V out. So we have V out over our load flowing out of this cap. It means that the resistor is here, right? This this loop represents that, that load resistance, our load. Right, so we have plus minus V out over our load. Right, so we're reinterpreting this equation as inspecting this node, the node of the capacitor, and noting that IL goes in and V out over our load comes out. All right. Kind of weird still, but interesting. And then finally, we have we have this third we have this third loop. So what is it saying? Again, it's kind of KCL, right? We have IG is equal to two G minus one IL. So again, we can kind of re imagine pretty easily that this is some kind of dependent current source, right? We're taking two D minus one IL out of something. What are we taking it out of? We're taking it out of the input source, right? So this represents the input voltage, VG, right? So this represents the output and this represents the input. So this is VG. We're drawing IG out of it, right? And that current must be equal to 2D minus 1 IL, right? So we're drawing out 2D minus 1 IL. All right, so IG is equal to 2D minus 1 IL. And you can redraw that as taking some dependent current, right? 2D minus 1 IL. IL exists in this inductor loop that we've drawn. And we're drawing that out of the input voltage source. Okay, so this is great. But how do we use this, right? Like, how is this actually useful? Well, it's useful when we glue all these things together. So what I'm going to do is place them side by side so it's a bit easier to see. So we had our third loop, right, which was the input. And this is 2D minus 1 times IL. We have our second loop, which is the inductor current loop, right? So on one side we had VG times 2D minus 1. And then on the other side we had V out. And this represents, as I said before, the inductor loop. And finally we had 
the capacitor, right? The capacitor KCL equation. And this represents, you know, the node of this capacitor. So, I mean, this is still kind of confusing. We, we can analyze this directly with circuit equations, right? If we, if we wanted to, we could use circuit analysis tools. And that's kind of the whole point of this, converting it into something where we can use circuit analysis to understand what's going on because we understand circuit circuits pretty well, DC circuits pretty well. And if we can use tools, use those tools to analyze switch mode power supplies, then we can kind of, you know, bring together different ideas to further solidify our understanding. So how do we make this even simpler, right? How do we make this so we can analyze it more simply? Well, it comes from the fact that these things are clearly related, right? These different loops are clearly related. What I've, what I've encircled are clearly related, right? You can see here that there's this common term, 2D minus 1, 2D minus 1. Right, and there's this common term, you could say, of one between both of these things. What does this look like to you? On one side, we have some voltage, and on the other side, we have a different voltage, right? A transformed voltage, right? Something that is transferred, right? We're taking current and produce a voltage. Turns out that this can be represented as a transformer. And this is super weird, right? Kind of weird and unexpected. So this isn't like a real transformer. First of all, this is just circuit analysis, but second of all, it's all DC currents and voltages, right? So we actually come up with this idea of a DC transformer, right? And this is just a tool. Right, it's not, it doesn't represent something that's real, it's just some, we're just using it to, you know, match up the pattern of transformers that we've learned in circuit theory to switch mode power supplies to make analysis easier. So, how does this work? How do we do this? Well, remember the transformer equations, right? So we have turns ratio. and we have dots. So first of all, the easiest way to understand the dots is if current flows into one dot, it should flow out of the other dot. That's the easiest way to interpret the dot convention. Next, we have a, a turns ratio N1 to N2, right? Right, and there's some relation between I1, I2, and V1, and V2. So V1 over V2 is equal to N1 over N2. And for this simple two-turn transformer, or two-winding transformer, we have I1 over I2 is equal to N2 over N1. Right, so there's just this inverse relationship between the turns ratios for voltage and current. And using this, we can kind of recast this weird looking dependent voltage source, dependent current source circuit into something that looks a little bit easier, right? Or maybe it's a bit more familiar to us. So how do we do this? Well, we have this 2D minus 1 times I eventually is equal to IL, right? So if we bring it back to this, I1 is 2D minus 1. Right, so let's match it up to this DC equation, or this DC transformer equation. Note, we have a specific circuit symbol for this DC transformer, and it's to put a line through it. And this tells us that this is not a real transformer, it's a circuit model, it's a DC transformer. Cool, so N1, N2, I1. I2. Well, we have I1 is equal to 2D minus 1 IL. I2 is equal to IL. And this is equal to N2 over N1. So dividing them out, we see that N2 can be 
2d minus 1, and n1 can be 1. And typically it's easiest to like leave one of these turns to be 1, right, one of these numbers to be 1, and just have the, the, the turns ratio only on a single winding. So we can transform these dependent currents and voltages into a transformer with turns ratio and conventionally signed dot convention as 1 to 2d minus 1. And what about over here? Well, this one's a little bit easier, right? You can kind of just see it directly because we have IL over here and IL over here. And we have V out over here and V out over here, which just means that the turns ratio is one. So this thing, this thing can be turned into a transformer, a DC transformer, right? With dots on the same side, with a turns ratio of one to one. So what does this do for us? Well, let's redraw the circuit again. So, what do we have? We have VG over here, right? We have a our DC transformer. This thing which represents our inductor, another DC transformer, and then finally our output, right? Which again kind of represents our output capacitor. So this is our load, VG. We have 1 to 1 over here, and we have 1 to 2d minus 1. Right, so why is this useful? Well, well, for one, we can immediately figure out what the conversion ratio is if you haven't already figured it out. For more complex circuits, this can be more challenging. But we can collapse this all, right? We can collapse this all into a single loop, right? We can bring this voltage over here and then bring it through here. So what do we end up doing when we simplify this? Well, we get a voltage source, which is equal to 2d minus 1 vg, which is connected to our load. And this describes the, the, the DC behavior of the circuit, right? In a very simple way, we can kind of just analyze this immediately. And think about where we started, right? The converter thing that we started with had these four switches, we were switching back and forth. Right, the interconnections were somewhat confusing. Right, it's a little bit harder to see what the conversion ratio should be. But, you know, taking a little bit of analysis or using a little bit of circuit theory, we can transform this relatively complex circuit, right, with switching behavior, switching dynamics, all that stuff, into something super simple, right? This is just like a one-liner. You can you can figure out what, what all this stuff is in one line, right? We have IL in here. We can see immediately that this current, which is VO'd over our load, is equal to IL, right? That's apparent in the circuit itself. And beyond this, what it actually makes it more useful for is when we introduce losses. So I think most practically what we can introduce is conduction losses. And I, I haven't really gone through an example of that with you guys yet. And introducing conduction losses significantly affects what the conversion ratio of a converter looks like. Right, and maybe you can kind of you can kind of see that just from say this simple example of including. Let's just include. Here, let's, let's do a boost. Let's just include. Oh, sorry. Let's just include a resistance to this MOSFET. So let's just say it has resistance R. So what does that mean? It means that in one state, we have this, right? And the other state we have something that looks like this, right? It'll so even just the inclusion of this single resistor, something weird happens. All right, let's, let's look at IVSB. So this is VL, 
So again, the voltage applied to an inductor averaged over one switching cycle is equal to zero. And it says that in the first switching cycle, we have VG. Okay, that's good. But the voltage here is actually different, right? The voltage across this inductor is related to the current flowing through the inductor, right? Is related to IL, IL times IR, right? We have IL times IL times R. So VG mi minus IL times R in one cycle. And in the, in the other switching state, we have VG minus V out. So clearly this resistance decreases something, but how much does it decrease it? Right? It's not so clear, right? We have to solve this equation. Now we're forced to solve CCB to figure out what the conversion ratio is, right? If we try to solve the conversion ratio, it includes IL now. Before it only included v voltages, right? At this point, we've introduced a new variable and it's, a, it's more complicated. So I'll leave that for you to think about for now. And in, in the next lecture, we'll go over, you know, including conduction losses in circuits and how DC modeling helps us solve them more easily. Cool. Thanks.